Well, good afternoon. Um, it is just turned afternoon here, and I've had a particularly um, busy, busy morning. Um, running around, doing all last-minute Christmas shopping, and getting all ingredients from uh, the local Asda Shore store for uh, minestrone soup and other items. So, anyway. Um, I do apologise to uh, Tracy Keogh because I was hoping that I would have, um, excuse me, been able to organise uh, a little live chat. She too is busy though, so uh, not to worry. We'll kick off um, with a, a few, uh, if you like, intimations. Um, first things first. Let me pop pop this up. Let me do this, let me do this, and let me pop up a bigger. Let me just make sure everything is working as it should do. Okay, um, so the first thing to say is that if any of you know, obviously we know who this is. If any of you know who this baby is, this beautiful baby here, if you know who this baby is, then uh, you can get in touch with them today and wish them a happy birthday. It's this child's birthday today. Um, if I've got my maths correct, um, then if this was uh, September of 03, then this... Uh, this little <laughs> baby here will be 18. Um, and of course, um, <laughs> it's one of the f funniest moments of uh, the series one when uh, Steve is all happy and smiley and they ask him, who, who, who's, who's the baby? And he says, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. But, you know... Um, isn't it interesting how, um, you know, this baby who's never met Steve before, quite happy, knows, knows that he, that he or she is in very, very safe hands. Let's just reduce it down a bit. Yeah, this baby knows, knows that they are in very, very safe hands. Um, and it's totally enjoying being there. Um, but of course, we know, don't we, thanks to Jim Bray, that, you know, these are the eyes of a, a really dangerous killer because he told us, he told the Sheriff's Department, the Manitroc Sheriff's Department, that he could tell that Steve was guilty by the look in his eyes. Anyway, so yes, if you, uh, if you know who this uh, baby is, I've already wished them a... a uh, a happy birthday um and had a couple of exchanges of messages so anyway um <laughs> if you know you could always say um rather than a little birdie told you you could say that a mad scotsman told me <laughs> that it was your birthday so uh, happy birthday and uh, <laughs> that might uh, that might be uh... yeah millbilly yes but the whole idea was not to say who it was, but uh, okay, <laughs> you've given the game away. Yes, it's it's one of Carla's daughters. If you know which one, then uh, then by all means send a, send send a yeah send a send a message. <laughs> yes, dark side, absolutely. Anyway, um, I'll just quickly run through this with you. As I say, Tracy can't be uh, can't be with us today. Uh, Tracy Keel, she's busy preparing, obviously for Christmas. But um, here is an article, and the title of the video, obviously, is you know how to get best informed well one of the best ways you can get informed two great ways to get informed 
read books and go along to presentations by, in this case, we've got obviously Steve, Steve Drizzen, Laura Nyrider, and here's David Rudolph. And let's just read through this article. If Tracy can't be with us in person, we can at least read what she had to say about Steve, Laura and David's visit to Melbourne. Um, just in case you're interested, of course. The dude was also there. <laughs> that was also clipped in Belgium. That photo was taken in Belgium. And it was many thanks to Tracy that the dude got to meet Steve and Laura. Um, and of course, <laughs> Steve knew straight away, ah, you're Eric Cozy. Didn't know his first name, but knew he was Eric Cozy, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. Right, let's get back to this one. Um, Melbourne welcomes Steve Driz and Laura and I read and David Woodall. So tomorrow, if you have time to write, it means everything to him. These words from Laura Nyrider were met with a collective sigh from an audience that had fastidious, fastidiously listened to Steve Drizzen and Laura speak of the injustice that has befallen Brendan Dassey for almost two hours. As the evening got underway to the strut inducing thunderstruck by ACDC, the plenary auditorium at the Melbourne Convention Centre readied itself for the throngs of Dassey supporters Yep, Dassey and Steve supporters, who had travelled from the four corners of the globe, that's very, very true, yes, from the four corners of the globe, to feel a tangible connection to the case and the incredible lawyers leading the charge. If I say Kratz, opening the proceedings, we're going to play a little game. If I say Kratz, you say boo. And the crowd obliged Steve with verve. Moments of levity were undercut with the reality of the continued wrongful conviction and incarceration of Brendan and Steve. Um, Steve Drizzen had called Brendan just before flying out to Australia and asked him, what would you like to tell your supporters in Australia? Brendan replied, just thank you for your support and I love you all. The audience was with Brendan. Laura and Stephen had succeeded in that moment, Brendan was in the room. Ah, let's see what I've done. It's very good. I'm all the way there. Let's head back up here. And let's try that again. Let's get rid of that because that's yeah, that's better. Sorry about this. As, as you know, my, my skills at negotiating um, articles is obviously uh, somewhat lacking. Did someone say prosecutorial misconduct? The, the inside making a murder and the staircase event offered a deep dive into the affliction that is prosecutorial misconduct and the conspiratorial pilfering of the presumption of innocence from a society that seeks not actual innocence but the standard of evidence that is beyond a reasonable doubt. This is a core principle of both the American and the Australian criminal system. Obviously Steve and Laura were joined um, by David Rubidoff who was obviously lead counsel in the Michael Peterson case profiled in Netflix's documentation docu-series The Staircase. Uh, professors Drizzen and I Rider joined David in addressing the damnatory pre-trial pre press conference held by then Calumet County District Attorney Ken Kratz. Kratz ensured there was never going to be a beyond a reasonable date for Brendan Dassey, oft debated as to whether it slithered across the line violating Wisconsin's rules of professional conduct for prosecutors. Rudolph simply stated Kratz should have been disbarred while Drizzen impishly recalled the continuing saga of the sweaty, disgraced former prosecutor's obsession with all things perspiration, regaling Kratz's presence at the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Drizzen told 
a student who felt compelled to relay to Steve that Kratz was in line sweating buckets. There was much ire for Kratz and his cohort in the wrongful conviction of Brendan Dassey Len Kaczynski. The audience vocalised their disdain at every mention and smiled at the karmic footnote that has ensued. Let me see, Kaczynski in an orange suit. There were commonalities, yeah, between the cases at the heart of making a murder and the staircase. Malevolent villains such as Blood Spatter Analyst, analyst. Uh, I believe that's Blood Spatter. I once got Tracy, I once got called out by the dude. Uh, so you're not getting away with that. It's Spatter, not Splatter. Analyst Dwayne Diva and the loathsome Kaczynski. Egoist DAs such as Jim Harding and Ken Kratz. Junk forensic science and media influence bias. There were also great chasms of difference. While the trial of Michael Peterson gyrated around forensic evidence, we acknowledge the case against Brendan is words and words only. Well, okay, but there's, it was only forensic evidence against Steve, so... Uh, They got to my head. We watched the concluding minutes of Brendan's March the 1st interrogation. Those five explainer minutes that Brendan's then counsel agreed to admit and keep from the jury. The juncture where Brendan expresses, expresses they got to my head, where Brendan, Brendan recounts to his mum, in a way only the two of them understand. Ineffective doesn't cut it. Brendan was once again failed by his legal representation who were ostensibly colluding with the prosecution. There were audible gasps around the auditorium in those moments, a sense of not quite comprehending that Brendan, a child of 16 when charged and now a man of 29, back then, in 2019, is still waiting in a cell in Wisconsin that this injustice continues. Yes, this, this next book is quite funny because, of course, Jerry Butin was actually a student of uh, David Rudolph. The evening pivoted when Professors Drizzen, Nyrider and David Rudolph. Sorry, the evening pivoted between them. Yes, yeah, of course it did. We had some uh, some of David Rudolph and some of uh, uh, Steve and, and Laura. And of course, what's also very funny is the, uh, as I've often shown, the, uh, the case of the other expert, Sami Shabani. <laughs> the, guy, the, guy, the guy who as a a, a, a so-called expert a crime scene expert <laughs> got victims and pushed their heads down toilets to see how long it could be before if it was possible to drown somebody in a in a toilet anyway <laughs> rudolph providing quite the anecdotist discussing michael, michael peterson with many learning that avery trial counsel jerry had been a student of Rudolph's. Does this mean David Rudolph is age defined or that master beauty matured early? Hmm. Yes, I, I think there's a, a few years difference between uh, uh, Rudolph and, uh, and beauty. But uh, you know, sometimes the, the, the age is, is not an important thing at all, difference between two people. Um, obviously, David explored the much maligned owl theory, unfortunately, without his PowerPoint presentation, causing flashbacks to his previous attempt over 18 years ago, when obviously David completely loses it with the guy in the uh, courthouse who has got all his slides muddled up. And we learned what inspires David to fight to protect the rule of law and what he fears he recited a quote, he's, he's done that at all the places I've seen him, by a prominent Lutheran pastor in Germany, Martin Neumüller. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out, because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, but I did not speak out, 
because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. It was an inspirational evening. Laura Nyrider, when asked why studies show that more than 85% of true crime fans are women, replied, because us women can smell BS, right? Followed by a rousing statement in support of Brendan and details of legal next steps. It doesn't take a lawyer to see Brendan belongs nowhere near a prison. And even um, Strange Exchange, who has taken the hunt with me, um, and I'm not apologising to, to them because of the crass uh, statement about the two crime scenes. But what I would say is I certainly don't want to make um, supporters, truthers, feel uncomfortable. So if I made you feel at all uncomfortable in my uh, um, discussions with uh, Strange Exchange, then uh, that was certainly not my attention. But certainly when it comes to that individual, um, you look, if you, if, you, if you want to go and unsubscribe and go elsewhere, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it, pal. Okay. I think I've made that clear. Anyway. Um, sorry, let's get back on track. As Avery's post-conviction appeal careers through the state courts. And remember, this was back in... Uh, this was back in March of 2019 when we were across in Australia. Brendan's team are ever watchful with options that include the pursuit of post-conviction relief back in state court using newly discovered evidence. I suspect that's probably what's going to happen once uh, Steve has... I mean, if the appeal court do it right, they'll just say, well, the, on the only remedy to you getting rid of these bones is just to release Steve. Um, you know, um, if, if you if you want to, if you want to, you know, just, just regard it as a, as a mistrial the first time around, if you want to try him again, uh, you know, good luck. But... Um, so newly discovered evidence would be obviously Steve's out um, of actual innocence or an ineffective assistance of counsel claim. But well, we've tried that before, so I, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. Um, Professor Driz, Drizin, Drizin sorry, spoke of executive clemency at the hands of the new governor, governorship of Wisconsin and the hope that changing, the changing of the guard offers, obviously, to Tony Evers. Um, some people have speculated, though, that it could be um, later on at the end of his four-year tenure that he might uh, do something like that. Um, we wait and see what comes first. Um, the appeal courts of the District 2 decision in Steve's case or something else. Um, there is much work to do, however. For just over two hours, we experienced a tangent, tangible connection to Brendan Dassey in an auditorium full of people there to bear witness, to show support for Brendan. Well, yeah, you can't get much more support than the dude. Um, we look forward to the day we see Professor Drizzen and Nyrider running to the courthouse for Brendan, ready to file. Ah, no, obviously this was, um, no, it must have been, Tracy must have done this within within a matter of hours, probably, of going along, because to catch Inside a Murder and the Staircase tickets available here, once they finished at Melbourne, I think they went to, I think they went on to New Zealand later on, but I know they went to Adelaide. Um, I think I think they did about five or six um, shows. Or maybe maybe this is alluding to other places in the world. Anyway, uh, there we go. So, unfortunately, as I say, Tracy couldn't be with us in person, but we have her words here to enjoy. Um, let's come on back, as I say. Um, can I show you next? Yeah, this is this is probably. Um, and, hmm, 
I'm going to say this is probably one of the dude's favorite pictures because this is out, outside. It's, it's still inside, but it's sort of outside in the foyer of the Enmore Theatre. And we'd only just got this banner. This banner was absolutely brand spanking new. Um, we'd only got it hours earlier. And here, here it is being rolled out. And people are just loving coming along and being associated with this banner. Um, and, you know, one of, one of the funny things is that, <laughs> and, and, and Mark will be able to tell you as much about this as I will, the dude was actually apprehensive about going to Australia. He, uh, he was a bit concerned uh, for various reasons. One was um, the fact that it meant taking a whole week off. Um, and certainly his, his boss was uh, um, accepted that he wanted to go, but uh, wasn't going to let him off on the Monday morning when his flight arrived in Los Angeles at six o'clock in the morning. And of course, the problem was that it was a uh, like an 11, 12 hour flight and he'd left Sydney at nine o'clock in the morning, Sydney, and he'd actually flown for 12, 12 hours or so and had gone back in time. Um, so <laughs> he used to, he always wanted to be Doctor Who, the Time Lord. Well, he finally got to, to fill, fulfill that that um, ambition. But also, of course, um, he eventually he did get his finger out, and he, and he did it in a in a sort of a timely fashion. Although, had he pulled his finger out right from the word go when it was first suggested, there wouldn't have been all the drama later on. Um, but in, in fairness to people that were helping out with his visa and passport, they did, they realised how much of a hurry he was he was in eventually to get it, and they helped him, um, and so everything worked out fine. And uh, you know, I can only say what a what a great time we had there in um, Sydney and Melbourne, and then a few months later in Manitowoc. And here, again, is one of the dude's favourite pictures. Um, but, yeah, going back to, you know, the dude going to Sydney and uh, Melbourne, it was, um, I think even for him, it was educational. He, he wanted to, to find out more and more about the case by listening to the lawyers, um, you know, getting a, getting a sense of, of what they're like, um, meeting them in person, very important. Anyway, let's get on to this next, this ne the next bit I wanted to, to look at. Just before I go any further, let's do a quick uh, run through who's all here. Sean, hi Sean, hi Alice, Dark Side, Paul, Linda, hi Linda. I thought, I thought I saw a mention of Dr. Silkman, who is uh, still recovering. So uh, hopefully you'll soon be uh, fit as a fiddle and raring to go. As you can tell by the picture behind me, um, books. One obviously cannot read enough books on on the subject. Um, going to the presentations is great. Um, and when we get the chance to do so in the future, strongly recommend going and seeing the likes of Jerry's. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing Jerry in the end of January. But when you do, go along with pen and paper. You know, don't waste that opportunity. Make notes as you're going along because there's so much information that they pass on. And obviously you'll enjoy the you'll enjoy the presentation. But you've then got something to look back on and remind yourself of it. Um, I've had the pleasure of seeing Dean and Jerry in, in Edinburgh. I then went to Amsterdam. 
in right at the end of 2018 at the very end of 2018 went to Amsterdam uh, to see David Rudolph and Jerry Buting in fact I can show you I've got a couple of photos of that we'd only just dude Mark and I um, we'd only just done the control question t-shirts and Jerry was quite happy to have a photograph taken um, I particularly like this one because I had a chance to spend a good 20 minutes chatting with David Rudolph whilst uh, Jerry was busy signing his books um, and I also got my book signed at, in Amsterdam but being a true Scot I brought my copy of the book with me and uh, he duly signed it um, let me show you and I think for me this is um, this is really nice he's put um, to Paul thanks for being such a strong supporter of real justice best Jerry Buting um, but I think that's a message to to all of us you know all of us that follow this case um, okay um, let's get back to here to that and let's go back to this um as i say i went to presentations at uh amsterdam and then it was literally just less than a month later i went and saw um steve drizzen and laura nyrider in edinburgh which was great then went to um, obviously to Sydney and Melbourne um, and then Jerry at the beginning of the year okay so not everybody and particularly at the moment can you go along and see and listen to these these people speaking and for me I would say books now in actual fact the first book I ever got on the subject was of course this one by Michael Griesbach and honestly Michael your, your last third of the book is just utter garbage you even refer to Ken Kratz as having a calming a pleasant calming voice you refer to um, Andy Colburn and Jim Lenk discovering keys keys plural in Steve's bedroom um, it's just garbage, Michael, and you know it is. However, the first two-thirds of the book that deals with the uh, 1985 wrongful conviction, very good, very informative. And sadly, I would have to point out that in this book, we have a, a bizarre um, recommendation or praise for the innocent killer. Um let me see if I can pop it up for you. Just bear with me a moment. See if I can see if I can find this. And I'll pop it up on the screen for you. If I can find it, it is praise for the book by Barry Sheck. And I suppose the one thing I'd, I would say about this is that, you know, if I've been harsh on guilters, then I suppose I would have to apologise from the point of view that anybody can be misled by Kratz's um, ridiculous conviction by the state's ridiculous conviction of Steve and Brendan because even when Mike Griesbach wrote this book which I'm trying to see if it's got daytime I think it was written before hmm yeah copyright Michael Griesbach 2014 so this was written before Making a Murderer came out 
And of course, at that time, everybody simply assumed that it was it was a case of uh, you know, the, the the evidence, this this DNA that was found um, on the hood latch, the um, the blood in the Rav Four. Everybody assumed that Steve was guilty. You know, how do you disprove all of these facts? Uh, you know, the key being found in the bedroom, the magic bullet with Teresa's DNA on it. Um, just everything to do with this case just um, pointed to, or people thought, just said, you know, oh, Steve's guilty. Even Kathleen Zellner herself, of course. That didn't wasn't interested in taking the case because, as is often the case, if it, if DNA evidence is being used to prove people's innocence, it's also being used to prove their guilt. Little did people know how prophetic Jean Couchet's words were when he said, "You know, has anybody ever been? You know, has has DNA ever been planted? Well." We, we know exactly why he said that, don't we? Honestly, this is taking a lot longer than I thought. Let me let me try this then. Let me try this. And I do apologise. I should have had these all ready for you. Um, and it's just at the last minute I've remembered about this. So let's see if I can find it a bit quicker doing it this way. Uh, yes, here we go. Here we go. At last. Let's uh, send that. Send. And let's come on back. Let's do this. Uh -huh. Hopefully I'll soon get that all, all set up for you. Um, how are we doing in the chat, guys? How's, how's, how's everybody in the chat? Um, let's see if I can get this to to work a bit better now. Yes. Okay, okay. That messenger's running a bit slow. Aha. Do this quickly. Let me show you this one. I think this is a, a bit. This, I, I would say, is unfortunate. I contacted Chris Fabricant of the Innocence Project. Uh, no reply. I've tried to engage with Barry Sheck himself. No reply. Um, I spoke to Jerry Buting and he said, look, I think really Barry's just talking. He would have been contacted about the original 85 conviction. Let me just read what it says, just in case you can't see it. But in the inside the front cover of The Innocent Killer, this rubbish book, well, last third is rubbish by um, Michael Griesbach. But it but praise for the innocent killer. The innocent killer is a shocking yet effective example of what can happen when our justice system fails. It poses the provocative question, one which those involved in the criminal justice system must ask themselves time and time again. What if, what if the investigation of Stephen Avery's alleged crime and its prosecution had gone differently? Would the tragic event that happened 18 years later still have come to pass? Um, I think you're out of your, I think you're wrong with your facts there, Barry. Um, the investigation was in uh, obviously um, eighty five, and it was um, twenty years later when uh, Teresa went missing. Um, 
with the tragic event that happened 18 years later. The only thing that happened 18 years later was that Steve was released, uh, so I don't think he's referring to that. Still have come to pass. You know, I can't help thinking about, you know, Mark Gundram um, saying that whilst we want to uh, give somebody the benefit of the doubt, given this information, it's, you know, it's, it's morally impossible to do. And then you've got two, two offerings by Sheriff Herman in Macon and Murder, and in one of them, ridiculously he says you know what what if we hadn't released Stephen avery from that 85 we know Teresa would still be here um but 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 i do find find this um rather rather disturbing um that somehow even barry sheck is accepting that um steve was guilty of murdering uh Teresa and uh you know, had he not been wrongfully convicted. I'm sure that's his angle. Um, I'm sure some of you will give me your opinions as to what this all means. Unfortunately, we'll never know. Griesbach's unflinching page turner raises all the right questions and brings us closer to the truth. Well, I, no, I, I don't think it does, Barry. I, I think, as I say, the, the last third is such garbage, garbage, I don't think it does anywhere near that. Uh, I just don't see that at all. Um, but maybe you guys uh, think differently, um, which would be great if you let me know, as usual. Um, so just quickly, um, as I say, I was, I was given this book by my daughter. She knew how interested I was in the case. She saw this in Asda's. She thought, great, inside the Stephen Avery case, the subject, so, so she bought this book. A wrongful conviction and its astonishing aftermath. It's a bit of a misleader. It makes people think that they're getting a good quality book about Steve's wrongful conviction. Um, the next book I got was Unmaking a Murder by Sean Atwood, and that is really, really good. And unfortunately, I can't show it to you at the moment because I've lent it to one of my pupils, but. Um, an excellent book. Um, then, obviously, we've got John Farrakh's Wrecking Crew. Um, John Farrakh, of course, has been, uh, had been the uh, journalist for the Post Crescent in Manitowoc, in, in, uh, in Wisconsin. And, of course, he, more than anybody, um, knows has, has followed this case and, and knows that the, the, the sort of major problems with this case one of my favorite art articles by him is that the lack of photographs mars the um the avery investigation um am i teaching making a murderer cases now i know that there are making a murderer uh courses out there uh i don't know that i'm you know, I, uh, I think so. Um, but yes, John Farrakh, excellent book. And it goes through all of the, the um, as I say, details about, for example, Tom Kasurik at the Sheriff's Department. Obviously, Jerry's book, very, very good. Really good read. Must A, a must read. Um, he also deals with another case um, that he was doing at the time. This one... Uh, I often quote a couple of paragraphs from this where Sandra Lane talks about the, um, you know, particularly the, the animosity aimed at, to, aimed at her for her trying to present the true facts of the Luke Mitchell, Jody Jones case, which happened just 20 miles up the road and is still unresolved. Um, this one I got, it's um, by Radley Balco, Tucker Carrington, and it's the well, you can probably know who it's, it's about the cavadier king the ca cadaver king and the country dentist uh stephen haynes and um i was going to say fred west michael west you know uh from obviously the the, the innocence um files michael west what a what a character, because we never get to see much of uh, Stephen Haynes, do we? Um, the most recent book 
um, Blind Injustice as uh, by Mark Goxie as um, Dr. Siltman will tell you absolutely brilliant the fact that it's uh, as it says there it's a uh, a former prosecutor exposes the psychology and politics of wrongful convictions pleased to say that um, as I say the plan is to have uh, a live chat with uh, Mark Godsey uh, January the 5th unfortunately it's um, it's going to be at 10 30 uh, New York time which is my 3 30 in the afternoon um, I apologize to uh, <laughs> our Australian friends it's going to be that I think my half three is your half two in the morning so uh, maybe catch it later on um, and also I'm hoping sh soon to have a chat with Richard Leo who we've already had a chat with um, earlier in the year I contacted uh, Richard Leo to tell him um, about the unfortunate demise of the dude and he's you know obviously Rest his condolences, um, and he said, "Yeah, he he'll, he'll come on and and have a have a chat with me about um, that book and uh, and other things in in general." So you know, I mean, this time of year, maybe maybe you'll end up with one or two presents that uh, uh, you uh, didn't necessarily want. Um, hopefully, you might end up with one or two presents that you do want. Um, if you end up with any uh, anybody giving you a few dollars or a few pounds. Um, you could do worse than investing in any of those books there, apart from the the innocent killer. Um, anyway, I think that's enough of me rabbiting on for today. Um, thank you all for tuning in, and we'll catch you very very soon. Bye for now. <laughs>